Have you ever been in a boring, pointless meeting at work and thought to yourself, this meeting could have been an email? Of course you have. Hey, it's Coach Jason, and in this video, I wanna talk about why we always fantasize about deleting meetings from our workplace, about a company that actually did that, and why that fantasy is mistaken. I'll share three important things that meetings achieve and ways that we can make our meeting culture better and more impactful. But first I gotta rewind the clock and tell you a little story about college. One of the great things about college is having rich access to performing arts. It felt like every weekend there was dance performances, acapella group shows, plays, or speakers. And there was this one dancer in our freshman dorm. This was like a lanky white boy with really kind eyes and strawberry blonde hair. And he would have performances and we'd go out to see him. And all the young women in our group, many of them who had a low key crush on this guy would scream, I see you, Johnny, as he like came onto the stage. And I think about this expression a lot because it is part of a trifecta that represents our deeply human desire for connection. I see you is about acknowledging that your actions matter. I hear you, which is about knowing that your voice matters. And I feel you is about saying that your emotions matter. Human beings are social and tribal creatures. There is a reason why solitary confinement is the ultimate punishment for disruptive inmates and why it so quickly harms our fundamental sense of self. Because we need to see and be seen by others. My friends Ricky and David started Flow Club to help freelancers, remote workers, ADHDers, coffee shop lovers, and anyone who wants a little company and social accountability to get things done with others. A term that some people call body doubling. As an occasional Flow Club host, I've seen attendees who have 300 500, even a thousand flow sessions under their belt, which brings us to Shopify. A little while ago, they made waves on the web for deleting over 12,000 meetings and attaching a price tag to every meeting based on everyone's prorated salaries for the meeting. I've seen this image go around and it kind of shows that there's this meeting, very important, and it's $2,000. Now this is seven people for a one hour meeting and they're saying it costs $2,115, which indicates that everyone in that group is costing the company $628,000 a year, which is a lot of money, even if you include stock or bonuses or whatever else, those are high level executives. The vast majority of seven person meetings do not cost $2,000. So part of me is like, is this a good example? But still, we've all been in meetings that weren't well run and big long meetings, even with people who aren't paid as well as this group, can still rack up a high bill, especially if they're repeating on a weekly basis or even a monthly basis. And look, I'm not here to apologize or you know defend useless meetings, but the idea that we could just eliminate many or most of the meetings in a company really only works with a very, very small set of people who have a extremely low desire to see or be seen by other people. A team of introverts and who are really good abstract thinkers, which, you know, is true. There are a lot of them in tech. I wanted to be alone. They might be able to pull off this kind of docs and tasks only version of working. But the reality is that work is also a huge part of most people's social structure. That's why getting laid off is so jarring. Even when you have severance, you're suddenly cut off from a huge circle of relationships and regular contacts that helped feed that sense of connection. And meetings are a chance for people to see each other, to confirm that we acknowledge each other's words, feelings, existence, and it's nearly inseparable from the act of collaborative work. Now, yeah, there are some organizations that have been successful with few or no meetings and a lot of async work, but they are exceptional in this fact that even the vast majority of successful organizations still have a lot of meetings. Moreover, I find the cheering for this meeting deletion movement kind of weird in the face of the fact that we've all been talking about return to office and a lot of people want to show how remote work has been so harmful and negative for a lot of people. And I worked on internal tools for Facebook slash Meta for a bunch of years. And it was very clear from our research that remote workers were slower to onboard onto you know, the processes and the code base compared to people who joined in person and they felt less connected to their teams and the company. But how do you do it again? I don't think that having fewer meetings is going to improve that process. The thing about bad meetings is that bad meetings happen because most people aren't disciplined enough to share an agenda in advance of the meeting, prioritize discussion topics, make crisp decisions during the meeting, 
provide constructive feedback on discussion topics and assign next steps and follow-ups. And do you really think that if we just canceled the meeting that everyone would all of a sudden be disciplined enough to like write a really detailed and clear document or email, have a timely and productive discussion through Slack or email or in the, the document and then make a decision, communicate that decision and assign next steps. People tend to be better at talking and listening than reading and writing. That's not good or bad. That's just how people work. And maybe you can hire for people who are really good at reading and writing, but they'll probably still have an easier time talking and listening than reading and writing. It just takes less brain power. Did you even read the memo? This also assumes that there's no emotional or interpersonal conflict in the interaction. And even when people are all professionals and generally kind and respectful people, conflict can emerge. I remember a meeting at Meta where we had to let this other team that we were partnering with know that we were deprioritizing work on the architecture of this piece of code that they had been building their product around and encourage them to switch to this new framework that we were developing, classic tech problem. And you know, they were pissed. But I came right out in this Zoom meeting and told them, look, you have every right to be upset. I recognize that you've spent a lot of effort on this integration and you've been really patient and you've really worked with us on all these bugs from the original one that we did. And look, we feel really bad about it. You know, it sucks, it's kind of bullshit. And I just really like leveled with them and, and listened to their complaints, let them tell us how mad they were about it. I helped them feel seen, heard, and felt. So that really opened the door to let us explain how the new framework would actually be more highly performant and scalable, which is why we were switching to it. By the end of the meeting, they weren't exactly thrilled, but they were no longer outraged and ready to tear us a new one. Now imagine if I tried to do that in an email. How do you think that would go? My sister, who is a very thoughtful, lovely, a uh, young woman sent me this excerpt from a book called A Crisis of Connection by Niobe Way. She's an applied psychology professor at NYU. And the excerpt describes how boys and girls consistently express a desire for an engagement in close intimate relationships with their friends that slowly faded as social pressures required them to change and withdraw how they express themselves. Like girls, boys openly express their desire for genuine connection with others, including with other boys. They reveal the human capacity for mutual understanding, care, and empathy, and demonstrate remarkably astute abilities to read the human world. Yet as they reach middle to late adolescence and the expectation of manhood intensifies, they begin to experience a crisis of connection in which they speak about losing trust and closeness in their male friendships and for some, no longer believe it's possible to have intimate relationships with other boys even though they continue to yearn for them. I feel our frustration with meetings are the same. We want to spend quality time with our colleagues in creative, collaborative, and purposeful ways, but we're often disappointed by distracted, uncommunicative, and self-absorbed conversations that really don't go anywhere. We think we can shield ourselves from the pain of these bad meetings by removing them, by deleting them, just as these teenage boys and girls give up on the idea of close friendships. What we need to do instead is do the hard harder thing of actually trying to make our relationships, our friendships, and our meetings better. That can mean how they are run. Several years ago, I wrote this whole piece in Fast Company about different kinds of meetings, including like the wins meeting format, goal fests, masterminds, there's like show and tell. If you're interested, leave me a comment if you wanna see other types of meetings and to talk about that. We can also instill a culture of having that agenda ahead of time. Or if we have a bigger meeting, to do pre-reads where you have a document ahead of time that gets sent out with background and discussion topics and that people can all weigh in and read so they have the context to make a decision. That's what we did at Meta. That's what we do at a lot of places with, with sort of more important meetings and it's something that we can all start to adapt. At the end of the day, meetings are not going away. Real-time audio-visual discussion between two or more people is a fundamental way that human beings have communicated for tens of thousands of years and predates reading and writing by a long shot. This is how we have connected as a species. We need to see each other. Let's just make those moments count. Rather than deleting meetings, let's make them matter more. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.